webinar for 2019. I'm Jen Mansfield and I'd like to welcome you to Monash University and to our beautiful teaching space. Um, first, I would just like to pay our respects to the peoples of the Kulin Nation on whose traditional estates we're meeting today, to their ancestors and to the children who are educating into the future. I would also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be present. Tonight we are Lucas Johnson. I forget your title, Lucas. <laughs> Our Research and Development Manager in STEM Education. In STEM Education. He's going to be our MC for the evening. Uh, so I'm going to let Lucas take over for now and I will see you all at the next seminar when I come back. <laughs> thank you very much, Jen. So thank you all for coming along tonight and thank you for your contribution to our questions. So as you registered for the seminar tonight, you were asked to pose a question. We've collated those questions and out of those questions created four key themes. Um, and those themes that we'll be addressing tonight are what is STEM education and why is it important, the challenges and opportunities associated with enacting STEM, partnerships in STEM education and promoting inclusion in STEM education. So next I'd like to introduce our panel. So our panel tonight, oh actually before I do that, <laughs> uh, we encourage you tonight to, to be involved and participate in our event. So, uh, if you are on Twitter, we encourage you to tweet using the hashtag MonashSTEM and also tag the handle Monash Education. And we'll also be using a tool called Mentimeter tonight where we'll ask you to contribute to the themes and questions as we go. So we'll give you uh, details on how to access that as we go. So first of all, on, on our panel tonight, we've got a mix of our academics and teachers and partners. So first I'd like to introduce Professor Mandy Berry, or Amanda Berry. Uh, Mandy is our Professor in STEM Education and our Associate Dean in Research. Next at the end there we've got Melissa Gap, who is a primary teacher and STEM leader and is one of our, our Graduate Certificate in STEM alumni. Then we have Dr Cathy Smith sitting there in orange, <laughs> Senior Lecturer in Science Education and the course leader of the Grad Cert in STEM Education. Then we have next to me Dr Mike Phillips who is also a senior lecturer. He's the leader of the digital education research team and he's one of our teachers in the grad certificate, graduate certificate in STEM. Uh, next to him we've got Marcus Mulcahy. Uh, Marcus Mulcahy is, our learning specialist, is a learning specialist sorry, at Carrum Primary School and he was recently a recipient of the Churchill Fellowship, which I'm hoping we might hear about a little bit about tonight. Um, then we have Gemma next to Marcus, who is the project officer um, with STEM professionals in schools at the CSIRO. And finally, we have Dr. Jennifer Hall, who's a lecturer in early years primary, prim, oh, sorry, early years and primary numeracy. Okay. Without further ado, we're going to get into our first question. So our first question tonight is going to be delivered, uh, directed at Kathy Smith. So. Kath, the question is, what is STEM and how is it different to the way we've always done things? Thanks, Lucas. Uh, welcome, everybody. Well, this is a really interesting question. It sounds like a simple question, but it's actually incredibly complex because the implications of the answer, I suppose, are far-reaching for teachers and students. STEM education is defined by the acronym, so obviously it's referring to the four key areas of science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And it suggests that um, these areas in particular are uh, have great potential for student learning, not just in terms of content knowledge, but also skills and capabilities associated which, with each of these discipline areas. It's interesting when you look at the uh, acronym STEM because when you think about curriculum, whether it's Victorian curriculum or Australian curriculum, you can immediately identify three areas of STEM very clearly within the curriculum, science, technology, engineering, um, science, technology and mathematics, but engineering is not um, one area of our curriculum that you would find. However, technology does comprise two areas, which is digital technologies and also design technologies. And so really it's the design technologies area that seems to encompass um, the sort of content thinking and skills that align pretty closely with engineering. So when you read about STEM education in curriculum documents, um, 
it's important to note that STEM is not just about the content knowledge, it's about the skills and dispositions that define these areas, but that requires a knowledge of the discipline themselves, each of the disciplines, to be able to identify what those uh, capabilities and thinking skills are. Um, STEM education is often represented in curriculum in ways that advocate an integrated approach to learning for students. Now, this is interesting in itself because it implies that in some way these areas should be connected, whether all four areas are connected or three areas or two areas. Um, but then that takes you into a whole complex realm of terms like interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. And I suppose this is a space where teachers and schools are trying to sort their way through what this means for practice and what this means um, for the opportunities that it can provide for student learning. So in a nutshell, it focuses on four areas. It highlights the connections between these areas and also Another important aspect of it is that learning is situated within authentic learning contexts where students are practising and developing the skills and knowledge they need for future life. Thanks for that, Kat. Now, I do encourage, if you're in the room or at home, if you can have a look there, to have to go onto menti.com and put in the code uh, 242796 and you can contribute to our word cloud that's happening around the room here. Um, so it's important to know what STEM education is, but I guess it's also important to know why we, we have STEM education happening in our schools and why it's so uh, prolific at the moment in schools. So we'll take a classroom teacher's point of view. So we'll start with you, Mel. Why is STEM education important? Thanks, Lucas. Um, well, I could mention that STEM investigations and inquiry promote or engage um, young female students to develop uh, STEM disciplines and therefore have a greater diversity into the workforce. Um, and I could also touch on, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of literature out there that is suggesting that we're on the brink of the fourth industrial revolution where automation and robotics is making a lot of jobs redundant. Um, but with that redundancy, new jobs are being created. So what does that mean for us as teachers in, in regards to how do we teach students students for potential careers that may not even be, um, that may not even exist at the moment. So um, as highlighted in these slides, um, children are born natural scientists and whether it's a generalised statement or not, but Carl Sagan um, suggests that they come into the school uh, environment um, with that natural curiosity sort of capped and therefore only a, a few might trickle through the system with that natural science and curiosity intact. Well, um, it, STEM really is important because we, w with that brink of automation and these new jobs for the future and that workplace readiness, we really can't afford to ha only have a few trickle through the system. We need a whole stream of talent and, um, and, and diversity to, to really, um, I suppose, make Australia competitive as a nation um, into the future. So um, having said that, I believe that time for us as teachers or just humans in general is probably one of our most valuable commodities and teachers um, are more and more saying that they're time poor and they're exhausted in this overcrowded curriculum. So one way um, that I believe STEM is important is because it can allow that integration of um, connections between curriculum areas that we can integrate like we've never integrated before and therefore um, like what Cathy touched on before, that sense of it's um, not just subject areas where there's uh, um, content knowledge being presented or taught, but it, it moves, um, as that graph shows, through this transdisciplinary, for a better word, process or approach to cross-curricular uh, cross connect and there is always a need for fundamental subject matter 
learning, that that's never going to go. But once you've got that content knowledge, we can then marry that with the essential skills for the future, whether that be creative and critical thinking or problem solving innovation, for example, and then couple the two together. So you've got your content knowledge, teachers can then Um, practice those skills and this notion of personalised students having a voice to personalise their inquiry, then um, that that sense of engagement and that learning experience can be so much richer when a student um, goes into a real world problem to want to solve, for example, that is purposeful or relevant to them. It means something, therefore the knowledge and the skills that are practised will stay with them rather than just that learning that content for later regurgitation. For that, Mel. Um, and now we might go over to Mandy who might give us a, an understanding of, from the research why is STEM education important? Thanks, Lucas. And you'll find actually that I've got some connections with what Mel was talking about and Cathy um, in terms of why STEM education is important. And um, I've just thought about four different um, arguments, if you like, or imperatives around why people talk about STEM education being important. So it really depends who's asking the question as to what kind of response that you might be giving for something like this. So um, Mel touched on the economic imperative, you know, how are we going to prepare people for jobs of the future, some of which we don't know um, yet that yet exist, but we imagine that they'll have technological, digital engineering capabilities, etc., so that Australia can be, you know, a capable country. So there's a political and business imperative around why STEM is important that is actually external to schools, but often gets pushed onto schools in terms of building particular kinds of capabilities in students. So it's interesting to think about each of these in terms of what kind of emphasis they place on STEM and a STEM curriculum in schools as well. The social imperative is a little bit different in terms of thinking about how do we prepare people who are able to manage in a new kind of world um, so that they can make confident decisions about important issues related to their own lives, the lives of their families, communities, society. We know there's a lot of complex problems that are facing the world today, like big problems in terms of climate change, food security, water cleanliness and sanitation, etc. And we need people who are able to be able to think creatively, critically, work together in teams, who have disciplinary knowledge to bring to bear on these particular problems, and who actually can be thoughtful citizens. Um, Think about issues related to personal family um, uh, situations as well and how people can be informed and um, capable of making decisions. So that's around a kind of social need in terms of what STEM education can offer in schools. Again, um, Kath and Mel have talked about the real world imperative Schools organise subjects according to separate silos, especially in secondary schools, and kids don't expect to be able to connect what they learn in one subject to another. And as a teacher, I know that I've had experiences of asking kids to draw graphs in science and they have no idea how to do them, even though I know they just did them in maths. So that idea of being able to have what we call the world outside of school as a kind of real world where actually there are new subject areas emerging, um, problems are brought together with different kinds of disciplinary specialists, um, there's emerging of different um, areas of, and disciplines. So how can school help reflect those particular mergings and how can school help reflect some of those complex and what often gets called wicked problems, almost unsolvable problems, and work together on those um, to better prepare um, students for that kind of real world um, experience as well. And the last one, which I was struggling to have a name for, but I'm calling it the visibility imperative. And that's my little picture with the the Lego lady down the bottom of the slide, um, is related to Areas of the curriculum or areas actually of life that are not quite visible that STEM can make visible in terms of possible career pathways. So, for example, 
As Kat mentioned, engineering has never been an explicit part of the curriculum. So how can we make that visible and how can we start to move from like generalisations around what engineering is to look at different forms of engineering, how that contributes to society around technology and the kind, different kinds of technologies available. And so we're offering our students glimpses of potential career paths that they can take that are beyond what the traditional kinds of ways in which we've organised subjects and careers. Careers. So it's it's opening up um, new pathways and making those visible to students, and particularly as um, Mel talked about, um, what what girls expect to be involved in, and what actually what all people expect to be involved in in their future careers. So reflecting on those, it's interesting to think about if STEM in your school, either what you're practicing or what you're preparing to do, which kind of imperative do you think you're responding to and how might the curriculum be organised in ways to help you to be able to better focus on that? Thank you very much, Mandy. Now, that brings us to the, the end of that first theme. So I'd like you to take a minute now to chat to the people on your table or for the people who are watching along at home in the discussion room to see if you can come up with an answer to what is STEM and why is it important. Feel free to add your contributions to our Mentimeter as you go. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you for that great conversation. We'll, we'll start on our next theme now. Jenny, if we can get the excellent... So just a reminder again, contribute to Mentimeter. So we'll start a new work cloud for this theme. So this uh, second theme is about the challenges and opportunities associated with enacting integrated STEM education. So we all know that um, technology is a great enabler for deep learning in education. So we're going to go to our technology experts to start with for this one. And we're just wondering how can technology support and leverage deep learning, Marcus? Uh, thank you, Lucas. Yeah. Thanks, Lucas, and uh, good evening, folks. How are you? I'm, uh, my name is Marcus. I'm from Karen Primary School. And I guess uh, one of the things that uh, we've always found really obvious, and maybe obvious to you as well too, the kids love robots. They love robots. They love coding. They love doing scratch. They love doing all those sort of things. It's fun. And I guess if you're a manufacturer, you're just living in the dough at the moment because you're making any robot and they seem to work and kids buy them and all schools, you know, make a lot of uh, hay out with their parents about, oh, we've got this robot, we've got that robot and the education department loves it as well too. But folks, have you noticed something? When kids play with these robots, they get bored after a while. Why are they getting bored? Because I got this feeling that it's pretty superficial, the actual learning which is going on. I think... And the kids know it and we know it as teachers that something needs to happen there. So if you want to try and get some sort of deep learning, maybe what's happening with Elba, Elmo up here is uh, part of the, the issue here. We, um, when I travelled overseas, went to um, a lot of schools in America, and this is a school in Oakland, California, and uh, there's a collective of teachers there and schools involved in what's called Take Apart. So Elmo gets taken apart and as you can see it gets labelled and the kids are looking inside the robots. They're looking inside the toys because they're thinking to themselves, hang on, this manufacturer had this idea, maybe we could get it to do something else. And so they're taking apart their robots and making them do things that they want them to do. So here's Elmo taken apart. Now, the beauty of this is Harvard University became involved. So Harvard University, through Agency by Design and Edward Clapp, they've actually got this whole thinking routine uh, pro program worked out. And these schools in Oakland and a whole across America are actually involved with um, Agency by Design thinking routine. So... They're giving the teachers, I mean, the teachers really, let's face it, folks, they're the special source that makes things work. So they're the special source and they're bringing some of these thinking routines to their classrooms and these kids are actually using some of those strategies to actually give the whole thing rigour, okay? Um, another thing which is happening, you mentioned about engineering and engineering is a really important thing because design thinking comes out of that. And this is a school I visited called Nuevo, which is in San Mateo, and they're using the design thinking to cover the whole curriculum. So everything is informed by design thinking. This is an amazing school and a lot of schools are now considering design thinking as the way to go in terms of how they should actually couch all their curriculum. 
Okay, so we and the schools, the kids use this from prep all the way through to year 12. At Karen Primary School, we're developing a similar thing. We've got a strategy in mind where we're trying to use this model here, trying to blend that with uh, agency by design thinking routines and see if we can actually do something across the curriculum at our school which makes sense not only to the teachers but to the kids so they won't be bored. So they think, hang on. This is actually something we can actually do something with. Folks, can I recommend highly you get onto Nuevo's website. They're offering some amazing ideas. And if you get onto Agency by Design, check it out. Find all their thinking routines and in particular the Oakland Agency by Design Schools Network. They've got a whole collective of schools who haven't got much money but they've got a whole lot of really interesting ideas and the kids love the work that's going on with Elmo and so forth. So I think um, this is where the key is. Take Elmo apart, folks. That's my suggestion. Thanks very much for that, Marks. Now, I'll pass to Mike, who I think he's going to give us an AR display as part of his yeah. response. Well, I, I don't actually like sitting down for too long, so I'm going to get up and do a few things. And, and I'd probably like to echo some of the things that were just said about actually getting kids to do things. I think that technologies provide opportunities for a lot of real hands-on learning. This is one of the bits that actually scares me a lot because as the supposed tech guy in the faculty, when I start pressing buttons, people expect things to work. Um, so what I'm going to show you on the screen is um, stuff coming from my iPad. So he says, hopefully. Yep, okay, so you can see what's going on with my iPad. The idea with augmented reality is that it adds to what you can see. So instead of just looking through the lenses of your eyes, augmented reality takes advantage of the lens on a camera on a mobile device like this tablet. Yeah. So if I fire up an app, what I've got are just some normal pieces of paper on the table here in front of me. And now you can see, for the people at home, you can see the people in the room, everybody wave, be nice, there we go. Um, and so if I point this camera at this piece of paper on this table, then what I'm able to see is something more than what I can see just with this piece of paper. I can see a full three-dimensional floating human body on this table here. And what that allows me to do as a teacher is give control over to the kids in my classroom. They can start they can start to explore what's going on by turning on and off different body systems. I might leave that one on actually. And so we can end up just with the skeletal system. And so students can start to have a bit of a look and start to construct their own knowledge rather than me as a teacher standing up the front of the room telling them what's going on. They can then start to say, well, what might be the relationship between the circulatory system and the skeletal system? And we can see the heart in the middle of the table there. If we want to get more information about the heart, we can just look at this piece of paper and we get a full 3D human heart that's beating that we can then do a virtual dissection on if we want to and come back to the whole body and see where that fits in again. So the idea with this is that we can actually have students doing a lot more without us as teachers having to direct that. Students are able to construct their own understanding and their own meaning. But more than that, if we don't just have off the shelf kinds of examples, but we have students creating these kinds of things, and we can do relatively simple ones just with students overlaying video, for example, um, onto an object. And I've seen fantastic examples where we might have, um, say, a virtual uh, periodic table of elements on the wall where students will create a poster for one element. And instead of just writing uh, a bit of information about that, I've seen that where students, uh, parents are able to hold up a, a device, a tablet device, and they're actually able to hear their kids providing additional information that they've been able to research. And that's really, really powerful, particularly for those students who might have lower literacy skills. They're actually able to communicate some of these connections that we're talking about in terms of STEM, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary learning, in ways that they might not be able to with a pen and paper. So the opportunity for um, engaging in deep learning with digital technologies, I think, is a really powerful one, particularly in STEM. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark, for that great uh, display of AI there. Now, technology is fantastic, but some schools' budgets just don't quite allow for that to happen for STEM. And, and it isn't the be-all and end-all of STEM education. So, Jennifer, what about schools that are in, say, low socioeconomic areas or have to do STEM on a shoestring? Yeah. Um, so I think building on what our previous two speakers had to say, um, first of all, considering technology itself, we have examples that are really incredible like this and, you know, very rich learning and lead to good pedagogy. 
And then we have some that are very superficial and you really have to think about as an educator, what is this actually adding? What are the affordances of this technology? Um, and it's really important to think if you're like, oh, you know, that was so great what Mike just did or, you know, oh, I really wish we had bots at our school or whatever, and you don't, you're just in a, you know, low socioeconomic area, you have to think, okay, so what mathematically or scientifically am I trying to get at with this, that this technological tool would allow me to do? What can I do as a parallel? Um, so I always do talk about that with my students, because it's like, yes, here at university, we have all these fancy tools, and that's lovely, but when you get out in the workplace, you might not have all of this stuff. So what are you going to do if you still want to do the same type of learning and same type of teaching as we're doing here. Um, so to use BeeBots as an example, so when I'm teaching my early years and primary students, we use them. And so if you haven't used them, they're just a little bee, about yay big. Um, and you just code into the bee and it moves you know, forward and back, it turns corners. So it's very simple coding for young children. Um, and I get my students to write out code on paper first and then say, okay, well, where would the bee go and see if it's following the path. And they love it and they play with the V-Bots and that's all great. But then we have to think, okay, what if you don't have V-Bots? Can we do the same thinking spatially and in terms of coding without having something like that? What would we do? And then I'm like, okay, make me the V-Bot. Tell me where to go. And you can do the exact same thing with people, right? Take a forward step, turn 90 degrees, take a step backwards and so on, right? So that's just a simple example of how you're getting the same kind of, you know, learning and the same type of concepts just without the technological tool. Um, another thing I wanted to also bring up is thinking about if you are in a low socioeconomic area and have families where the parents typically are not as well educated as some other areas, is thinking about, well, how can we support the families, right? Because you always want the, the families to be in partnership and kind of thinking the same uh, wavelength as you are as a teacher. So how do you support them so they can support their children? And they may not have the resources at home, right? And they may not have the educational background to be able to support their children. And so some simple things are just, you know, bringing them into the school, right? So have a family STEM night or a math night and get talking to them about, well, what are you doing in the school? Why is this happening? What can they be doing at home? And then supporting them as well. Just simple things like take home bags. So sending, you know, kids home one at a time, with a bag to do an activity together, right? So then it's strengthening that community connection and it's helping the parents to become more scientifically and mathematically literate as well. Thanks, Jennifer. Some great ideas there. Marcus, what about you? Do you have any advice for teachers who are trying to go along with STEM on a shoestring? I think uh, one of the, the best things I mentioned is teachers are the special source. So that means that uh, we can actually we in our network, and uh, Helene's over there, she's part of our network, we've uh, linked up in our Northern Peninsula Network schools. All of us are working together as a cooperative because we've only got limited resources, limited cashola, and uh, so we as teachers work together to help each other, support each other, which is a really important cheap way to actually get ideas and tips and tricks. And uh, one thing we haven't done, which we will do, is actually uh, also, I mean, every school's got components. Some schools got more robots or more this and or more that or more ideas. So that sharing of resources as well too through schools is really important. Doesn't often happen, but I think it's a really smart way to go for we've got less money. So we need to like work together. The other thing is that we've done at our school, we've actually uh, tapped into the expertise in the community. So we've got experts there in, in software development, experts in doing programming, experts who are actually carpenters, experts who are builders. A lot of them out there, we live in a pretty much a tradey type area down Karamai. So bringing those people into your school costs you nothing, but you're bringing unbelievable expertise to the kids and the potential of how you can use those in maker spaces and STEM labs. So I think that uh, just being a bit smart about how we actually connect with our community, both teachers and our own teachers uh, community in our schools is uh, probably a smart way to go if you're trying to stretch the dollar. Thanks for that, Marcus. Now, our next question is going to go to Mal. So, Mal, what challenges or opportunities arise when planning for learning and assessment in STEM? A lot. Um, and I touched on before that, you know, teachers are a little time poor and when, when, we, when we meet together, um, I suppose the – at the forefront of a teacher's planning time is what are we just going to get these kids to do? Quick, 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 plan, plan, plan. Um, where I suppose um, the real challenge is to not just get them to do but to perhaps be 
um, part of the learning and I touched on that student voice earlier before and to um, personalise that inquiry. And how does that look? Um, I'm predominantly from a primary um, school background. Um, how does that look when we've got uh, literacy leaders and numeracy leaders in the school that are still very firm on keeping a two-hour literacy block and a one-hour numeracy block in the weekly timetable? And how, how does that allow the flexibility and the fluidity of integrating STEM faculty or curriculum across a five-week a five-day week timetable when – and I also came from um, a Catholic school, so you've got to fit in your religion component, then there's all your specialists and it really doesn't leave a lot of time left in the um, in that six hours that you've got these students that you're trying to engage and do these amazing investigations. So that does pose a challenge um, when it comes to organising your planning time and how to do that, I suppose, respect – the amount of effort that you're trying to um, put in to enable such an amazing learning experience for your students, um, yeah, that that does pose a problem. And does Cathy want to? Thanks, Mel. Yeah, so Kath, you've spent a lot of time working with in-service teachers when it comes to planning science and STEM units. So can you elaborate on Mel's response there? Yes, um, I think one of the areas that I think teachers seem to struggle a lot with is assessment in relation to STEM. And the area that seems to be the most problematic is around the capabilities, particularly areas such as critical and creative thinking. And um, first of all, teachers themselves have to clarify in their own mind what is the difference between creative thinking and critical thinking and then how you map a progression of development uh, for students right across the years, what that looks like. How do you recognise creativity in your classroom? Does it look different in different disciplines? Um, and, and then how do you map a progression and how do you communicate that? Now, if you went to the curriculum and you looked at the scope and sequence chart, you'd think, oh, that's all pretty easy and uh, pretty straightforward. But often the challenges emerge in the translation of these documents in terms of um, students' individual learning needs, what that means for the nature of the learning experience that you need to provide for students, what type of evidence you gather um, to support the judgments that you're making. So I think that uh, assessment still seems to be an area that is quite challenging. And uh, just recently I was working on a team that did some research in South Australia with teachers looking at critical and creative thinking. And, you know, even the documents themselves in lots of ways don't support teachers because those two types of thinking are just lumped together and uh, teachers are expected to make decisions about that. So I, I still think that that's probably a great area of um, challenge. The areas of opportunity um, I'd probably like to point out are a little bit different. Um, we're standing back from the classroom. We talked about engineering before and Mandy and I were just saying that when you position engineering or design technologies in the classroom, you open up a whole lot of opportunities for learning, but you also almost hold up a new lens to learning and you can change the conversations that take place in the classroom. So, for example, in engineering, we know that the idea of failure is essential and it's valued and it plays a really important part in um, the design process. And so that creates some really interesting opportunities to change the way we talk to students about working through ideas and divergent thinking and valuing divergent thinking. The other thing that I think becomes an opportunity links to one of Mandy's imperatives, which was the visibility imperative. We know from studies, particularly um, we had um, Helen Forgaz and Gila Lita here at Monash did extensive studies around girls in STEM education. And one of the biggest challenges for girls was that they couldn't actually identify with the STEM areas. They couldn't see themselves in the future in career positions. So STEM actually opens up some opportunities opportunities for us to 
burst open the stereotypes, I think, and change those, again, those sorts of conversations and the sort of um, representations that we include. The other thing uh, that I wanted to pick up, Marcus actually picked it up and I had it written down here, was that, you know, we tend to think of STEM as these professional areas and yet we have an amazing array of parents who are working in high, highly skilled STEM areas carpentry, electricians, all of these areas. I think it's actually a wonderful opportunity to present these parents as experts in their field coming in and sharing their thinking and their expertise with students. Unfortunately, our TAFE system has been decimated and yet really STEM sits pretty comfortably and, and should be well supported by that particular area because there's lots of pathways into STEM, uh, in STEM professions. So I think there's some opportunities there that are a bit beyond perhaps just the curriculum and the teaching opportunities um, that we could perhaps consider. Thanks for that one, Cathy. Uh, Mel, would you like to add a bit oh, more? Oh, yeah. Yes. So just um, reiterating, um, so the planning opportunity, so I spoke before about um, what could be a challenge, but I just wanted to touch on um, what is a great opportunity um, when you're creating or planning for an inquiry process. I suppose there are so many different methodologies for planning, whether you choose the 5E um, five E's or there's the Kath Murdoch um, tuning in, sorting out, uh, finding out, um, inquiry process. There's so many to choose from. But one way to gather assessment that I've found um, really successful um, just in the last year was using the design thinking process and as in particularly following the Stanford um, D design thinking model, um, which is great because the very first step is to empathise with a real world problem. And what, once you've got that empathy, uh, you can really hone into intercultural and ethical capabilities just there. So there's a, a really good, um, uh, like I said before, with that feeling of being time poor, you look at the curriculum, how am I going to get through all this? Well, just through one design thinking model, you can um, already start to see that um, quite organically, you don't have to try too hard, that areas and opportunities for assessment come through. Um, and that as you work through the design model, um, when you're creating prototypes, for example, then that's an opportunity for the other general capability capabilities like teamwork and collaboration, um, a trial and error, students have to think through their ideas, refine their ideas and at the very end of the process and dare I say it's about the journey, using that word journey, but um, it is about that journey through that learning and it doesn't always have to mean that there's an end product but when you get to the end um, it's so vital and paramount really for students to even do a self-assessment and self-evaluate how they think they went, um, regardless if the end product is complete or successful or not, because that, that's all part of the, the learning as well. So, yeah, STEM has great opportunities in that regard. Thanks for that, Mel. Now, one of the great parts about my role is I get to go into schools and spend a lot of time talking to teachers and how they're grappling with this. And many of them have faced the challenge of, do we integrate STEM or is STEM a specialist subject? Do we do it through a lunchtime club? So, I'd like to throw to Marcus now. What are your thoughts on on the way you attack STEM? I guess. I guess. Um. I mean, every school's got its lunchtime clubs, and we've got our scratch club, and the kids, the scratch heads, love it every Tuesday. They come in there and scratching up the place, and then we've got radio club as well too. Cause we've got the internet radio station at our school, so those kids who want to develop the communication skills, got the internet radio going on there, at Radio Carum. Check it out, folks. And uh, also, we've got um, we've got uh, just Digitech club as well too. Largely, that's for the junior kids in our school. So there are lunchtime clubs. Every school does that. But I mean, in reality, folks, we all know that uh, it cannot be just a standalone subject. It's obviously got to be integrated across the curriculum and um, and we're all involved in those sort of things. And I was looking at it. Do you want to click the next slide? Yes, I've got a slideshow, folks. This is uh, when I was when I travelled to the US. This is um, – there was a school I went to. They're called, it's called Marymount School in New York. It's uh, a high-end private school, girls' private school, and uh, they've got what's called a nerdy derby. So, you know, the, the that track there you can see – oh, 
the track over there, you can see that's the uh, the track they were using to actually like race these vehicles down. See the vehicles on the right hand slide over there? They're the vehicles which they built and created. So what happened was the the, the guy who runs the makerspace there, he um, just, you know, I've got this, got this nerdy derby going on here at our school and the maths curriculum team, they said, oh, we can actually, can we be involved with what you're doing there? Because it's a really interesting idea. Maybe we could apply some earn and learn type concepts to the nerdy derby. So he said, yeah, let's do that. So then you've got, what you've got now is you've got, then the literacy people become involved as well too because they wanted to get into blogging. They wanted the kids to actually record how they're actually developing their, their little vehicles. So we've got here, we've got the, we've got the vehicles, you got to use derby dollars to buy the feathers, to buy the wheels, to buy the body, to buy whatever you want to do with it. And you can choose to actually uh, go for three type um, prizes. You could have the slowest car, you could have the fastest car, and you can have the queen of the hill. Now that track doesn't show up, but it actually goes up like that. And the idea is they've got to try and engineer the car in some way or another to actually stop on the halfway mark of the track. That's quite a feat. So the, these are kids in year grade six. Grade six that I went and visited the school, they're doing grade six, they're their nerdy derby development. So we've got three areas of the school there. We've got the, got the engineering, we've got the, uh, got the maths, we've got the literacy people all working together on something that the kids loved. It's unbelievable, the passion for it. And we know that STEM itself is, we're living in a golden era, and it is the thing that kids love to be involved with. And this is just one little example about how integrating the curriculum or across the curriculum makes sense to the kids and to the teachers at the school. Not hard, folks. We're actually building one of these at our school this year because we have actually spoken to our local, Patterson, our local secondary school, Patterson River Secondary College, and our kids are going up there uh, in week seven and eight to work with their senior students in their lab because they've got all the resources. We haven't got the resources. They've got their lab space. We're going to build ourselves a nerdy derby and then we're going to use that as a vehicle to actually show at our Digitech conference, which all Helene's involved, which all the schools in our network, 20 schools come together to celebrate Digitech, the kids' conference, and they'll be playing this nerdy derby, getting their, their uh, derby dollars, what do you know, folks? We've got STEM across the curriculum. Don't we love it? So, Thanks, Marcus. Um, Gemma, your role at CSIRO is connecting teachers with STEM specialists. So what are your thoughts on the idea of STEM integration or um, you know, STEM as a specialist subject? Um, so I'll preface this by saying all STEM education, regardless of the context, is valuable um, and that obviously different schools, STEM education will be dictated by the various schools, um, resources, timetabling, things like that. Um, and then when we talk about integrated STEM, you know, there's two ways to look at that as well. There's integrating science, technology, engineering and maths within each other and then there's integrating those four across everything else. Um, and I guess I'm pro both of those things. Um, and the reason for that, there's a sort of a, a few different reasons and some of those things have already been touched on this evening. Um First of all, it's more real world. Um, in the real world, STEM isn't siloed. You know, we have um, people who are working as, as carpenters and electricians, as has already been said, that are, are using maths and um, engineering and they wouldn't be described as mathematicians or engineers in, you know, um, in, in what they do for a job. And, you know, we don't want um, our students to think that, we only do science to become a scientist or you only do maths to become a mathematician when realistically these are going to be used through um, especially, you know, more into the future across whatever career they have. Um, and I guess that leads into the second reason that I, I think that we, sh we should be integrating STEM is um, to bust the stereotypes of what science, technology, engineering and maths looks like. Um, you always have, uh, you know, I, growing up I went to a girls' school and it was certainly not cool to be good at maths. Um, you know, I'm not very mathsy, I'm not very techie, but, you know, I've got all the apps on my phone. Um, and so we want students to realise that science, technology, engineering and maths is so much more than what the media, um, particularly certain TV shows, um, will portray those things to be. So if we can embed it across different um, contexts and different curricula, um, it's going to encourage students who traditionally wouldn't be uh, engaged in those because of the stereotypes potentially, um, yeah, it will engage them to become more involved. Um, what else did I say? Yeah, I think that was, yeah. 
Uh, thanks very much for your res response there, Gemma. Now, I'm going to throw it across again to the tables where you have a bit of a discussion at your table about uh, the challenges and opportunities in enacting STEM. But I do encourage you to tweet some of your responses or to go onto our Mentimeter there. Um, please remember when you're tweeting to use the hashtag Monash STEM and to tag Monash Education in there. So we'll have a couple of minutes at your tables now for some discussion and in the discussion room at home. Thanks. Okay, due to time, we're going to keep pushing through tonight. So sorry to cut your conversations off at your tables. <laughs> I do apologise. There will be there will be plenty of time for discussion after the session. So we're going to move now to our third theme, which is partnerships in STEM education. Um, we're going to, I'll just make a note that we've changed. So for Mentimeter, you'll now see that there's a different code for the Mentimeter for the next two um, themes. So that code is, I'm trying to read that, 108551. You'll see that on the screens around you. Um, so our first question goes back to Gemma. So Gemma, how can forming external partnerships leverage quality shared learning opportunities for students and teachers? Um, okay, so I work for uh, the CSIRO in a uh, program called STEM Professionals in Schools, which does exactly what it says it does. Um, we take STEM professionals and we partner them with teachers to enrich uh, STEM education in schools. Um, and this program has been around since 2007. And during that time, it's been ex uh, evaluated four times and we're just um, undergoing our fifth evaluation now. Um, the most recent one we have, so not the one that's happening now, is by Deakin University. And I thought um, I'd just give you the stats on what they found. Um, so pardon me from reading for notes, um, but the evaluations have identified a number of positive outcomes for teachers and students, including increased, increased student engagement. 79% um, of our teachers reported increased student engagement directly attributed to their partnership. So that's um, quite a big uh, statistic. Um, student access to a STEM professional. So um, I think of some literature I read recently said that most students who go into STEM careers do so because they have a family member in a STEM career. Um, so if you don't have that, then you're less likely to go in. So to have access to a STEM professional from a sort of a younger age, I guess, um, highlighting the importance of STEM in everyday life and student access to contemporary knowledge, um, especially in the IT sphere, we find that um, by the time people are teaching the IT curriculum, it's already starting to go a little out of date and that's, you know, that's nobody's fault. That's just how fast technology moves. Um, now, this evaluation was completed in 2015, but um, as I said, there's one currently in process, but we found that every evaluation that we've had just supports the one before it. So we expect to get the same results again. Thank you. And uh, no doubt external partnerships are so important for uh, quality learning opportunities, but we could also think of partnerships as internal partnerships. So teach, teachers across faculties or teacher and teacher. So Mike, what do you think? Oh, I'll go to Mandy first. What do you think about the idea of internal partnerships in schools, Mandy? Thanks. So I'll make some big picture comments and then I'll um, throw over to Mike. Um, because one of the things that we start to immediately think about is like structural and cultural conditions within schools and how that enables or um, reduces opportunities for partnerships between teachers. So ideally, if you have a timetable where people are able to be able to meet or bring classes together, that's going to facilitate um, the opportunities for learning from each other in partnership. Obviously, some kind of connection um, around our shared interests in a particular theme or disciplinary area can also bring those connections together. But formal timetabling can be um, well, it can be a challenge in terms of how to bring teachers together as partners. Um, meetings, sometimes the meetings that take place um, in schools can be directed towards sharing together, bringing together different disciplinary groups and having an opportunity to be able to talk in those ways. So what maybe structural conditions could be manipulated within schools to help bring teachers together in that kind of partnership. I think leadership modelling is very important. So that idea of this is a school in which teachers work together in partnership and take risks together and learn um, Teachers may want to do that, but they need to see that it's being valued from the top and they need to see examples of that in practice from the leaders themselves so that if a school principal is walking past the classroom and it looks like there's sort of messy stuff, noisy stuff going on, that that's actually part of understanding that teachers are experimenting with practice together. 
So the structural conditions, leadership modelling and people's own personal views and willingness to open up in terms of connecting with other teachers, showing that you are ready to learn about something different that you may not feel particularly comfortable with, putting yourself in the place that you're probably situating your students in as learners in a new area as well. So your own personal stance as thinking about yourself as a learner and willing to learn in partnership with others becomes really important in facilitating those kinds of partnerships. Um, I actually did my PhD research on this as to how teachers in schools support one another and help develop knowledge um, in, in one another. And I'd echo all the things that Mandy said, but there are two additional things that go beyond just the structural kinds of things. So just bringing people together doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to have great working partnerships. So two things from, from my research from a number of years ago now that still hold true. One is that teachers need to have a shared repertoire. They need to have a shared language to be able to communicate effectively with one another. So they have to be talking the same language. And the second thing is they have to understand that they have to have a shared um, uh, aspirational endpoint. What are we trying to achieve and how are we going to get there? And so once we have this kind of sharing and, it, and that's made explicit, then we start to find that we get more effective outcomes from teams of teachers within schools. Thanks, Mike and Mandy, for those responses. Now, Mel, you've got an example of an external partnership that you were involved in last year. Yes, yeah, so we, uh, the school where I worked at partnered with uh, Zeus Victoria and um, we had a look at the curriculum and there was a science area about adaptations and, you know, so taking away the traditional learning about adaptations, we were fortunate enough to, to bring that into a real world uh, situation where students identified with um, with partnership with the zoo, 21 of uh, Victoria's most endangered species. Um, and then we had lots of literacy involved with researching those species. There was um, design and tech and a bit of art involved because we had to actually construct these little puppets and get the local visitors to fall in love with what essentially would be an unknown species. Because um, we all know that, you know, Sumatra tigers and the pandas are endangered, but you might not have known about the little um, hel helmeted honey eater, for example. So the students really got involved. It was very rich, very purposeful for them. Um, they were spruiking, they were selling, like handing out badges, save the Tasmanian tiger. It was pretty fantastic um, uh, real world for them and uh, a great opportunity to for the students to, you know, um, as a, uh, if for those parents in the room, you know, you could speak to your children, but if somebody else tells your child the same thing, then they, they listen. Well, that's what we found as teachers. You know, we could be teaching the content, but when they hooked up on a webinar with the expertise from the zoo or when they actually visited the zoo, we, we could have, as teachers, said the exact same thing, but when an expert said it from the zoo, then they listened and then they absorbed. And um, so that was a great example. Fantastic. Thanks, Mel. Now we're going to do a very short conversation at tables this time, one minute. Um, just about partnerships in STEM, whether it's a partnership that you've been involved in or what you think could be the benefits of partnerships in STEM. Please remember to contribute to our Mentimeter. Thank you. Okay. I'll take that little lull in conversation as an opportunity to jump in here with our final theme for tonight. So our, our final theme is about the idea of promoting inclusion in STEM education. We do hear about the idea that um, we want to bring girls into STEM and that um, and there's a whole range of uh, groups that we're trying to bring to STEM, but then we also hear the idea that STEM is a, a chance to extend students and certain students are being selected for STEM opportunities. So I'm going to pass this one to Jennifer. Um, how can we ensure that STEM education is an inclusive pursuit for everyone? Okay, so I'm going to focus on gender. That's my area of expertise and area of research. Um, but I want to highlight that Certainly girls and women are not the only underrepresented group. People from low SAS backgrounds are underrepresented. People of color are underrepresented. Certain sexualities are underrepresented. So I think it's really important to remember how much everything is connected. It's not just about gender, even though that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, and I think with this, like there are a lot of, you know, girls in STEM programs and that's great, but we really have to be careful that it's not a deficit model of, oh, the poor girls, they need extra support. You know, so being careful the way things are framed is really important. And, and really examining your own biases. And if you have the chance, have someone, have a colleague come into your classroom, just sit and watch what happens. How are you questioning people? What types of questioning 
questions are you asking to what groups? Um, so examining your biases, examining the students' biases very explicitly and bringing in um, some resources. Click. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and so um, Gemma mentioned about media resources, and I do a lot of research into representations of math and mathematicians in the media. Um, but another thing to bring in is look at actual products that are being sold. These are all real t-shirts that have been sold. Uh, some here, some in North America. Um, the top left is from the Children's Place, which is a Canadian store that's targeted at little girls. Uh, we have Allergic to Algebra from Forever 21. That's a woman's shirt. Same at the bottom one there. Who needs math when you're already a 10? And then the I'm Too Pretty to Do Math, you can find that on all kinds of clothes, on pencil cases, on all kinds of stuff. And again, this is all current. This is in the past few years or this year that people think that this is acceptable. Multiple adults working at these companies think that these are acceptable messages to be sending. You know, and this is what children are growing up in. And you have to think, okay, so how as an educator am I going to target this? Right? Both with the parents, right? Because what do you do if some little girl comes to your class wearing a shirt like this? How do you address that? Um, unfortunately, there are companies that have reacted to that. Click. <laughs> um, and so the top right one is from the Children's Place because they got a huge backlash about that one about everything except math. So they put out an I Love Math shirt, which is good. Um, the other top left is from Jimboree, another children's company, and including um, science and math in there. Um, the one in the middle is from a company called Princess Awesome, and they do girls' dresses and other clothes that are science and math and video games and things that are not traditionally on little girls' clothing. And her shirt there says, I solve my own problems. Um, and it's those kind of things to bring in and talk about with you, right? Because it's not enough to just teach content. We need to think about the cultural milieu in which this teaching and learning is going on and all of those messages, right? You can be the you know, the greatest teacher and having the most positive and encouraging and inclusive messaging going on. And then they get home and mom and dad are saying this and they see this on TV and they see this in stores. And how do you counteract that? So I'll stop there because we're short in time. <laughs> uh, great. Thanks for that, Jennifer. Now we're going to um, throw it over to Kath now. Um, Kath, what are your thoughts on the idea that um, STEM is for gifted students or best used as an extension activity? Well, this is interesting, isn't it? Because I think quality learning and teaching is actually about really effective student engagement for all students. And if we can provide that to attend to all students' learning needs, whatever they may be, and we can provide learning experiences that by nature uh, enable us to differentiate between those learning needs, I think that's what really matters. And so when we talk about student engagement, you know, we want learning experiences where students are behaviourally engaged, where they're effectively engaged. That means they actually care about what they're doing. And that's where the notion of an authentic context, something that they're doing that actually really matters or makes a difference becomes really important. And of course, we want them all to be intellectually engaged. The intellectual engagement will be different for different students, but we hope that by design, the sorts of learning learning experiences that we provide can enable all students to be engaged and be learning. So uh, it's interesting to note that sometimes students who struggle in very traditional classrooms, when they're put into open problem-solving situations, actually thrive and really start to demonstrate skills and capabilities that we don't normally see. So I think there's advantage in STEM, given the sort of experiences and partnerships that we've talked about for all students. Marcus, would you like to add any further thoughts to that? Folks, I was thinking our gifted students really, I mean really, Every student is gifted, I'm sure. I mean, I know at our school, we um, just as an example, about I think it was two years ago, we had a boy. He loved going through, you know, the um, every year there's always the chuck out rubbish day, and everyone puts their stuff on the curb, and everyone there's all sorts of junk there. A couple of years ago, this boy brought in all this stuff, which he found old computers, old televisions, all sorts of junk. Just brought into school one day. And, I mean, he wasn't, I guess, academically, you would say he wasn't like a high flyer, but I tell you what, he was the smartest kid in the school that day because he brought in this stuff and all the kids said, oh, what's that? 
oh, this is that. And so he was teaching all these grade sixes who were normally out playing sport, were all in the classroom at lunchtime, taking apart old televisions and old computers. And then he was saying, well, hang on, if you've got that wire over there and you've got that battery over there and you've got that globe over there, you could actually make something work. So he was the smartest kid in the school, gifted students really. I mean, really, every kid's gifted and who knows what their potential is. But if you give them the opportunity and exposure to some of these things, anything is possible. And that's the day I learned that, my God, anything is possible by some of these kids. And he was a brilliant kid. He got our Digitech award at the end of the year because he showcased some amazing things throughout the year. That's great to hear. Thanks, Marcus. Now, my, the final question for me tonight is directed at Mandy. So often we hear the idea that, uh, you know, or they have the question, is it STEM or STEAM or or all the other acronyms that are out there at the moment. Um, Mandy, how do we think of STEM beyond the acronym itself? Thanks, Lucas. I think I've got a slide to come up here um, now too. So I want to go back to a point that Gemma made before in relation to an integrated curriculum and integrated STEM. So we need to be thinking about what are the purposes for the learning that we're engaging students with and are the purposes related to a particular kind of problem solving using particular kinds of skills um, for a particular kind of outcome in relation to the connection between science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Or are we wanting to do something general, for instance, connecting up different areas of the curriculum with science or maths? Um, for instance, or technology. So going back to purpose really matters as we think about these particular combinations of the acronym. Sometimes I get worried as more and more letters are added into this particular acronym. What actually happens? Does it start to dilute the purpose of it in the first place and it becomes a kind of like smoothie of all these particular um, areas instead of retaining the integrity of those disciplinary areas that we're trying to bring together in the first place? I have no um, problem with, being, with integrating different areas of the curriculum into the tasks that we bring to students, but we should be clear about what we're trying to do through them and then what kind of outcomes and purposes that we have in organising them. So, for instance, if we're thinking about how do you bring um, um, an artistic idea or um, the ideas of the arts into STEM, for instance, is it in terms of helping kids to build representations of their reasoning and thinking about a particular problem? Is it in a way of trying to create a language of symbols to communicate one with another around what it is in terms of the problem or situation that you're exploring compared to how do we um, make a nice looking picture about something that's not really related to the idea of the STEM but might be related to the aesthetics of the art area. So as you're engaging in these kinds of activities and thinking about what is the integration that's going on and how can the integrity of the disciplines be maintained and the ideas of the disciplines be combined in a way that helps to be able to produce a particular outcome? What are you doing towards that? And of course, it also comes down to who's available in the school to do these things. Um, in a recent experience that we've had in um, interviewing teachers about integrated STEM, it's the technology teachers who in, the, in a couple of schools who have been um, leading the integrated STEM. So of course, they're going to be bringing their own particular areas of interest and expertise into that and connecting with who's available and willing and um, able to be able to um, bring together certain kinds of activities that will work in that particular environment. So I think there's an important message in terms of the integrity of the integrated STEM, but that's not to mean that we can't do other disciplinary integrated activities. Excellent. Thanks for that response, Mandy. And we are going to throw it over to the audience for a few questions. But before we do that, I'd like you to join me in giving a hand to our panellists tonight for their great answers. Um, now, Jen Mansfield will be running around with a microphone. So if anyone's got a question for one of our panellists tonight, would you like to pop your hand up and she can come over and give you the microphone. Or that also goes to the people um, online if any questions coming through from there. Chantel. Yet. Must have been quite comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was the name of the augmented reality app you were using before? Popular. Uh, yeah, so that one, that one's actually a free app. Um, it's made by a company called Daiquiri. It's spelled D-A-Q-R-I. And you're wanting the Daiquiri uh, 
Anatomy 4D. Um, iOS is, so if you've got an Apple device, um, it, you've, it's recently gone through an iOS upgrade and so it's, it hasn't caught up with that yet, but it certainly is working on Android devices still just fine, um, but it might just be a week or two before iOS catch up. But that's free um, and they do an, a range of other ones and there's heaps of free ones out there. Just go to a, a, a app store and search for augmented reality and start having a, having a look. Thanks for the question. We had a question over here. If you'd like to continue, just wait. Sorry, just wait for the microphone so people at home can hear. Is that on? Yeah, thanks. Um, look, uh, assessment was brought up earlier. Um, uh, assessment is something that has very significant outcomes in education. Everybody here has gone through an assessment system. And geez, we're all bloody good at it because we all got here, you know. Um, yet it fails a lot of people. Um, so, you know, we all know about NAPLAN. Just briefly, what, what do you guys feel about NAPLAN up the front? <laughs> anyone, anyone in favour? Anyone want to say anything nice about NAPLAN? Anyway, no one wants to or have seen, seen politically correct not to. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, but, yeah, that gives you an idea. And that's sort of like – because, it, you know, it's, it's funneling education into a sort of way of behaving – to, to suit the actual outcomes of the assessment. Now, as soon as you get into assessment, I can't remember who talked about it, you start to funnel the education to suit the assessment outcomes. So, you know, we're talking about assessment and the challenges of assessment. And someone said, um, oh, it's the journey. Yeah, I agree, it is. And yet, but at the end of the journey, we're going to have assessment, aren't we? And that, 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 to me, it's actually trying to get away. And yet, no one in this room really wants to get away from assessment because that's what says we were bloody successful. And so we're preconditioned to behave in that manner and run that system because we were bloody good at it. I guess so, it depends on how you think about the notion of assessment. So there's formal summative assessment that occurs at the end of a particular activity or process. And there's also the formative assessment that's going alongside. And I think maybe some of the things that people were talking about here is like how do you capture the journey in ways that make sense for the kind of assessment that you want to represent? And so that, it, that it's not only, a, you know, there is a summative picture, but there's also a formative picture that you can um, uh, capture and that you can also um, illustrate that I think is a really important part of the message that we need to be sending. Yeah, I'm actually trying to have get a change in thinking about assessment and, and go to some sort of process that, like, if you're an, you're an artist, you'll have a portfolio. Mm -hmm. And getting away from assessment being something on a piece of paper but just actually saying, talking about what children do, and looking at what they do and not having some sort of formalised assessment process because I think it's very limiting and it, it, it has an effect on lots of kids. It actually, it actually fails them. I think that's what people are talking about. Um, and and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I suppose, the way you want to view it is that that's the education system that we have here in Australia and therefore we sort of have our – um, a system that we're mandated to um, report and whether it's a NAPLAN um, system that the students still need to undergo, that's not really for me to – I mean, I've got a judgement about it, but I, I still need to work within the system that, that you know, we're employed into, I suppose. Thanks very much for your response. So we might move on to another question so that we have uh, opportunities. Chantelle's got one from someone playing along at home. Lucas, I've actually got quite a lot of people online and quite a lot of questions coming through. Um, firstly, there's a lot of comments just thanking the panel, like it has been very informative and to have different views as well, that's coming through from the onliners. Um, so we've got a question from Caitlin. How can we help schools integrate STEM? It's easier for individual teachers to run STEM programs, but it's much harder for an integrated unit to be run in secondary. Anybody on the panel like to attempt to answer that one? So I'm, I'm doing some work at the moment that's actually starting to look at the different forms of knowledge that are represented in the way that teachers plan to teach, so from different STEM disciplines, particularly from science, technology and um, maths. And um, 
and the way that they make decisions about what they plan to do. And when you start to look at the interplay between these knowledge forms and decision making, they can actually be quite different very different in fact. Science teachers think about the way of representing their content knowledge very differently, for example, to maths teachers. And so that's not necessarily to say that these two things are oil and water and can't mix. Perhaps actually what we want to do is we want to celebrate those differences and and highlight those to students, that there are different ways to conceptualise these different problems. But if we don't, if we're not aware of those differences as teachers, and that comes back to some of the stuff I was talking about earlier, about having a shared language of, of being able to talk through these kinds of differences, then it becomes very hard to have a program that works effectively. You can have teachers timetable to work together, but they don't necessarily come uh, out with the the outcomes that you might expect. So one of the things to be aware of, uh, what are the similarities and differences that each of these disciplines bring to an integrated approach? Thanks, Mark. Anybody else? Or would we go to, we'll go another online question. Um, This one is from Shelby. Is there a scope and sequence we can use to help teachers when it comes to teaching STEM? Kath, you look like you'd like to respond to that one. Well, this is an interesting uh, consideration, isn't it? Because in the Graduate Certificate in STEM Education, we talk about the fact that there is no STEM curriculum per se. Um, And so teachers are working in this space where they're trying to make these decisions and map their way through it. So um, in terms of our Australian curriculum, no, we don't particularly have a scope and sequence chart around STEM education. Um, And so that's the answer to that question at the moment. I suppose one thing that we can say is that we're trying to work with teachers who are developing those kinds of um, sequences within their own schools and, you know, part of the work that we are doing is bringing teachers together to try to create those. And just building on that last question too, I think that um, the work that we've been doing has come has come across teachers, particularly in secondary schools, that are playing around with these structures to enable them to work together more collaboratively. And as Mandy said, when leadership gives teachers permission to think and work differently and eases up some of the timetable constraints and opens opportunities and says to teachers, here's a place to play around in professionally and to uh, explore some different ways of working, um, then really exciting things are starting to happen. And we are particularly interested in learning more about schools that are doing that sort of work because that's quite groundbreaking. Thanks, Kathamania. I think we've got time for one last question, Shelley. My question's for Jen- Jennifer, I think, yeah. You were talking about making sure that we don't frame opportunities as a deficit model for girls and others. But the reality is that we, we've been in deficit for those for many years. So how would you frame the opportunities? I create opportunities and I'm getting 70% girls' schools coming or people coming along because they know that they're missing something. This is in the secondary space. So how would you frame it so it's not a deficit model? I think it's really the way you speak about it. So it's not that, you know, the girls are lacking, therefore we need to do this or the girls will not you know, reach the level of the boys and people of other genders. Uh, it's that, again, explaining and, and again, being very explicit and talking about the types of things we talked about with the media and what parent, you know, the biases that parents hold and other people in these children's lives, that we do live in what is still a very sexist society. And mathematics and science and engineering technology, those are fields that have huge issues Uh, with gender, you know, and related um, identity characteristics to gender that do put people that are not in the the majority group at a disadvantage. So it's kind of, this is to assist with that. It's it's like you've probably seen that model of, you know, equity is, you know, versus um, equality. So equality, you know, we're all standing behind the fence because that's fair. Everyone's got the same right? Versus, you know, the short person should really have a tall box to stand on and the medium person gets the medium box and the tall person doesn't need a box, right? So it's kind of that idea that it's not 
framing it as, oh, there's something inherently wrong with girls, but there's something inherently wrong with the system that is failing girls. And that's how I would frame it. And, you know, and non-binary people and so on. All right. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for tonight. So thank you for everyone who came along and those people who watched online. Um, and once again, thank you to our panellists tonight for some very thought-provoking, insightful responses. Thank you very much.